Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 13, as mentioned. We're going to be looking at verses 8 through 14 as we, we continue in our series here in the book of Romans. So I'll begin reading at verse 8 in chapter 13 here of Romans. I'll read to uh, verse 14. We'll get into our study. Romans chapter 13, beginning at verse 8, reading to verse 14. Paul says, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is a fulfillment of the law. And do this knowing the time that uh, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness, let us put on the armor of light, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its, lust, its, uh, its lusts. So Paul has been giving commands concerning Christian living. And uh, I'll just summarize and then we'll move into our study. Christians are to live under the empowerment and control of the Holy Spirit. He had pointed out that we have spiritual gifts and we're to exercise them for the benefit of other people. We also are living in such a way that it will evidence the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Now, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love. He had said in Romans 12, verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy. In verse 10, he said to be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. So that helps us to understand the gifts and the fruit of the Holy Spirit, how they work together. God's Spirit produces love and love motivates us to care for one another. I pointed out that in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, that Peter spoke about exercising spiritual gifts, but he had begun by exhorting us to love. He had said in 1 Peter 4, 8, Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. The word cover means to bury or even hide from sight. So if we're going to serve God and exercise His gifts, we're to do so in love. Because the gifts and the fruit of the Spirit work together. When you look at the uh, description of what is called the fruit of the Spirit, it's found in Galatians 5, and 23. I want you to note something. I'll read that to you and point one brief thing out. Uh, Paul said, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there's no law. It's interesting, and it's been pointed out in the past, that he didn't say the fruits. Uh, there are a lot of times that I've heard people over the years speaking of the fruits of the Spirit, as if it's being spoken of here in Galatians 5. I find it interesting to note that he says the fruit of the Spirit, singular. And what does that mean? Well, it would seem to me that he's using the word love and describing it with eight other words, because a lot of people don't know what love is. And so he describes it. It's joy, it's peace, it's patience, it's kindness, it's goodness, it's faithfulness, it's gentleness, it's self-control. All of this is under the banner of, of what love is. And so when people use that word love, they need to remember how it's defined and described. And so as spirit-filled and spirit-led believers, he has pointed out that we're going to be the best citizens in the nation. We respect authority because we understand that government is from God. In the first nine chapters of the book of Genesis, government is one of the things that he has established as, a, as one of the pillars of, of society, along with the church and marriage. And so we, as spirit-filled believers, respect authority because we know government has been established by God. And we also realize we can suffer consequences when we break the law. So what do we do? Well, we obey. We also follow the law. Because our consciences demand it. Now, I was thinking of some basic things that are very petty, so bear with me. Because we think of love sometimes 
and uh, obedience and all. Uh, sometimes we think of that in, in very general, general tenses. And so how can I show love and obedience to commands in a general way? Well, I started writing some things down. We don't run stoplights. We don't run stop signs because we can hurt other people, right? We don't park in handicapped spaces. That's one of my pet peeves. I sit there, I tell Marie, okay, the Chino PD is on, you know, on duty, speaking of myself. And I'll say, that guy's parked in a handicap. I, it really makes me angry. I'm going to go break his leg. So he is handicapped. <laughs> it's one of my peeves. I'm sorry. We obey the, the traffic laws. We don't want to crash into a family. We don't shoplift just because in some cities we can get away with it now. Listen, if our government, our government is corrupt, we do have options. As citizens, we can present concerns and we can present grievances. That, I think, is in a practical way being shown by the parents who are attending school board meetings and trying to take back control of their kids. And we can reject what is a violation of constitutional rights. Uh, Okay, I'm not going to go deep in this. Don't worry. It is something I think about. Um, And it's just one instance I could give many, and I won't, but constitutional rights, mandates that force me to do things just because somebody says I need to do that. You know, we were told you need to wear masks and on all of that, and and I obediently did that. All of us did, I think, to some degree. We were forced to do it. Who are we to argue? What do we know? I'm not a doctor. I'm going to follow the advice of those that I respect. I think we normally do that, right? But after a while, you start seeing the hypocrisy of it, and you begin to wonder. And so in July of 2022, everybody knows Dr. Fauci. Uh, Dr. Fauci stated that he recommend that the country be shut down. And that was something that you saw with so many hurt. It hurt small businesses. It hurt families. It hurt so many people. He he said, and I've seen it on tape, he recommended the country be shut down. But in August of 2023, he said, I never said such a thing. And see, so when you have one person saying two different things within a year, it causes people like you and me to begin to question, to begin to wonder what's being told to us. Is it true or is it not true? I think you have to, you know, continue to to be aware. I'll put it that way. When I became a Christian, I didn't take my brain out of my head and put it on a shelf somewhere. You know, I still listen, and I still observe, and I still think about, and then I question. Because I believe strongly, and I'm not not saying this because it's just my belief, it's true. Confusion produces an easier way to control people. And that's what we saw taking place. And you still see that to to this day, and you do see that, and I'll just say this and move on into the Bible study. I believe we're being set up. I believe that people are once again going to be attempted to be forced into their basements so that there's no real ability to see debate and to discuss discuss issues. And I believe that we're being set up. I need to be we need to be aware of that. I really believe that. So we have the right to oppose uh, government mandates when they violate our consciences and our understanding of Scripture and the freedoms that we possess. Now, am I saying let's get some signs in March? No. Uh, uh, what I'm saying is let's be aware. Let's be aware. So we were looking at human government. I wanted to add that caveat before we go on. Going into verses 6 and 7 and then finally moving on into our study. Uh, we pay taxes because they're intended for the welfare of all. Uh, we also are to give proper respect to those in political office. And so with those things said, we move to verse 8. He said, oh, no one anything except to love one another. Oh, no one anything. Let no debt remain outstanding. Be paid up. Learn to live in moderation. Learn to live within your financial means. Do not get yourself in over your head as you accumulate material possessions. In Luke 12, 15, Jesus said, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, 
He said, life does not consist, life does not find its purpose in the abundance of possessions. And so we need to be aware of this. You see, when you borrow money, which we all do at one point or another, make sure that you make your payments when they're due. That's what Christians are to do. That's because honesty and integrity are to be earmarks of a Christian. Proverbs 22 verse 1 says, A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. My father taught me this. My father was a truck driver, blue-collar worker, but he would rather pay his bills, and he did. He would pay his bills first before he fed us. And, and that's a fact, because my dad taught me by example and word that my name means something. And that's what my dad said to me. He said, your reputation, your name means something. Guard it. So... I have done that since I've come to faith in Christ at the age of 20. I've been aware of that. And so I think we all need to. If you borrow something, give it back. If you borrow money, pay it back. That makes sense. If you take out a student loan, pay it back. Marie was a college student when we began to date, and she graduated, got her degree. She has a Bachelor of Sociology degree out of Cal Poly Pomona. When we married, she had a student loan, and we paid it off. It wasn't that big a loan, but it was a loan nonetheless. She knew that when she signed papers to take out a loan, that she should pay it back. See, that's one of the reasons why I have a big difficulty with this idea. Let's pay everybody's loans off. No, when you take out a loan, you pay it back. That's what you're supposed to do. And You know, if you're 20 years old, 21 years old, and you're in college, you can vote, but you don't know you're supposed to pay back your loan. That doesn't make any sense to me. So Christians need to be just good people. Here's something for you. Psalm 37, 21, the wicked borrows and does not repay. Hmm. Let's be careful not to be wicked. So be careful not to accumulate debt. It ruins your testimony. Irresponsible money management brings a reproach to the name of Jesus Christ, and your reputation suffers when you default on loans. And remember this, borrowing money places you under the power of the person that you owe. In Proverbs 22, 7, the rich rules over the poor, the borrower is servant to the lender. And that's absolutely true. So what do we do? Well, owe no man anything but to love, make sure you pay We should save. If you can, save. Establish a budget. Do not overspend. Do not frivolously incur debt. Pay cash when possible. We know you can't pay cash normally for a home or a car. That's understandable. If you have a card, pay it off monthly. Don't overspend because you're going to end up in just too much pressure. Christians prioritize finances. And for me, I taught my children, and this is what I learned. My gifts first go to the Lord. So when I get paid, our first check, if you will, has been to Jesus. Why? Because he supplied for me. Why wouldn't I give back to him? So I prioritize the budget. And so the Lord is first. Everything else comes afterwards. And, yeah, we've had plenty of times, Marie and I, where many times, you know, you don't have that much, and I'm not going to make a big deal about this other than try and illustrate this. You don't have that much finances, but that doesn't mean you need to have a lot of money to have fun. It just means you need to be creative, to find the things that you can do together that doesn't <laughs> break the bank. And we learned to do that. I, I still remember uh, I was in Europe. I had saved up. I went to Europe just before Marie and I got married. She's been mad at me since because I could have taken her there on my honeymoon. But I had more fun with my buddy Nick. But I called her up, you know, and, and uh, actually I wrote her some, from some country I was in. I was there for three months, and I, I wrote her, and I said, when I get back, I ain't got no money. I'm not going to be able to take you out. I'm not going. So she said, that's okay. We can have fun just being together. So she's been having fun being together for a long time. <laughs> she said it. She owns it. But that's true, isn't it? You don't have to spend a lot of money to have fun. 
You just need to be together wherever it is. And that's just a fact. So we need to, we need to be aware of those things. Now he goes on in verse 9, and he says, uh, All the commandments, the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, murder, steal, bear false witness, covet. If there's any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So he gives an abbreviated list of commands. These are lists that are related to these commands that are speaking of our duties to other people. And so that's what Paul is wanting us to know. How, how are we to continue? How are we to uh, treat others? Verse 10, we're to love them because love does not harm. It does no harm to others. Love does no harm to others. It fulfills God's intention, he's saying, that is revealed in his law. In other words, love motivates a believer to not take advantage of other people. And so, how many, how many strifes, how many problems would be, would be settled if we wouldn't take advantage of each other? And so he's saying, listen, all these commandments, which are duties to man, he says, they're all summed up in one command. Love your neighbor. Treat others as you would be treated yourself. Love others. Show them courtesy. Show them kindness. Why? Because that's what you would desire. And so you're to be proactive. You're to show them, not wait for them to show you. You're to show them. You're supposed to love them first. And they respond. And so he's simply saying all the commandments of God are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. And now as he does that, he, he goes into another portion to provide motivation for this action. Verse 11, he says, Do this knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. So this is a practical application of what we've been seeing in the verses prior to this. Now he says in verses 11 and 12, do this knowing the time. Now it is high time. Awake out of sleep. That's what he's saying. Paul is concerned that they've been lulled into spiritual apathy. And because of this, he's telling them, wake up. Wake up out of your sleep. So I looked up sleep. What's the definition of sleep? We all know what it is, but sleep is a state of inactivity with a loss of consciousness and a decrease in responsiveness to events that are taking place. He's saying awaken. Awaken to the things of God and awaken out of the sleep that you're in. Awaken from spiritual unconsciousness, from inactivity, from unresponsiveness. He's saying Church, be on the alert. Be on watch. Reject complacency and dullness of heart. Now, Jesus said that in Mark 13, 35 through 37. He said, watch, therefore, for you don't know when the master of the house is coming. In the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, in the morning, lest coming suddenly he finds you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to all, watch. Now, we're to be awake. We're to know the times. We're going to know the things that are going on. Be aware of these things. He says, knowing the time. That word knowing means to understand or to perceive. Perceiving the time. That word time speaks of a set period of time. It says, know the necessity of the moment. What is taking place now? Know the necessity of the moment. The word of God applies to all situations. How does the word of God apply at this moment is what he's saying. So we're to be people who are aware of the moment we're living in. We know that we're living in the last days, and we know we have an allotted time to serve. So we're to be wise. We're to make the most of our time. Why? Because the time is short. In Ephesians 5.16, Paul had said, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. When he says the days are evil, the word evil means actively opposed to you. We're to redeem it. The word redeem in the Greek word is exagorazo, and it means buy back or buy out of the marketplace. In other words, Christians are to be aware of the spiritual climate. We're to be aware of what's going on. And so we don't have that much time. We have none to waste, and therefore we shouldn't waste time on things that don't matter. That's why God redeemed us. He says in verse 12, the night is far spent and the day 
is at hand. Time is limited. Do not be indifferent. In John 9, verse 4, Jesus said, As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. But he went on to say, Night is coming when no one can work. We need to operate while we still have opportunities here in the United States. We are very slowly but very surely losing our rights. I was looking up uh, some things in, in uh, you know, in some, I, I go to sources sometimes uh, that can inform me concerning conditions throughout the world and, and, and certain countries' restrictions on evangelism and, and you know, proclaiming the faith of Christ. We, we Americans uh, are pretty, well, we've been built on, on biblical principles, and so evangelism has always been part of our constitutional rights. We can, we can share what we think. Now, a lot of Christians have been silenced because they, they're afraid of being canceled and all of that. That's, been, that's an odd kind of thing to me. The threat of someone not liking me will keep me from telling them about Jesus. But in Afghanistan, in North Korea, in Somalia, in Libya, in Yemen, in Pakistan, in Saudi Arabia, in Iran, in Iraq, and Sudan, every one of those countries and others restrict or forbid Christian evangelism. All of them. And that can happen here. We have been already restricted from gathering to worship. We have already had that happen. Did you believe, I'm looking at some of my gray hairs, did you believe that in your lifetime that would happen? No, of course not. We're in the good old USA. That would never happen. But did it? Yes. Can it? Yes. We've seen it. And we've also heard the apologists who say it was for your own good. Really, at my age, I think I can decide what is my own good. I think I can. And when it comes to children under 18, I think I can help my grandchildren too because I've lived a long life and I've kind of seen these charades in my lifetime and the things that are done to oppress and to tyrannize and to steal rights and liberties. I've seen that. I've grown up around that. I've seen that. I remember the things that took place in 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 my own lifetime in history. That's what's taking place right now. We're being restricted. There's an attempt to silence you. We need to be aware of that. Christians are being called activists now. Why? Because we reject educational programming. Believers are being reprogrammed. People who profess a a belief in, in Scripture are being reprogrammed. People who speak their mind are being programmed. Jordan Peterson, some of you are aware of him. He's a Canadian psychologist. I, I think he's, he's professed a faith in Christ. He still has a, a language problem. I think he's educated enough to learn to declare what he thinks without profanity. And every once in a while, I'll, I'll listen to things he has to say, and I can't help but believe this guy is brilliant. But he is being censored. He's a Canadian, and therefore the Canadian um, Psych- Psychological Association there in Canada is, uh, is, is, uh, is going to still take away his license to practice because he has to be reprogrammed because they think he's just too outspoken. That can happen here. Don't think it can't. That can happen here. Now, some of you who are of college age, perhaps in college classes, you already know that happens. You already know that there's a peer pressure amongst the students, and it's also that is generated from the professors who have an agenda. You know that. If you don't know that, that's taking place. We all, we all should know that. And so what's happening? Well, when you reject certain things, people get upset at you and call you names. That's what they do. So, again, I I applaud Sonia Shaw. She's the president of the Chino Valley Unified School District. And she she has stood up in opposition to um, to, uh, the rejection of of, uh, parental notification concerning the the children's determination uh, to proclaim themselves to be of another gender and all of that. She stood up and they've reacted against it, and I applaud her. I bless the Lord for her, but she's received death threats because of the policy. They've even not only said they wanted to kill and dismember her, but they've threatened to kill her children and even her pets. And so that's taking place right now in our backyard, right here. That's taking place right now. And these kinds of things escalate if we're not aware and if we're not responsive. 
There is an obvious move to censor and to silence opposition. Uh, you, they just won't publish what you have to say on, uh, on some of the social media. They won't publish that. Or they, they hide it, bury it, reject it. They do that. Jesus is returning. We have to be busy doing what we can. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So the time of man's rebellion is about to end. God's reign is about to begin. Jesus is returning at any moment. We're to be busy until he comes. Now, knowing that Christ is returning is to motivate us into action. And seeing that the time is short, it's important to share our faith. In 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote something very scathing. It's found in chapter 15, verse 34. To the Corinthians, he said, Awake to righteousness, do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. You've been caught up so much when living in what you call his grace, he was telling the Corinthians. And you know, those of you who have studied through 1 Corinthians know that he gives like eight, nine verses where he commends them. And then from verse 10 in chapter 1 until the end, he rebukes them because of the things they've been doing and not doing. And he says, you haven't been faithful in communicating the word of God to others. And, and he said, I say this to your shame. Some don't have the knowledge of God. Not only those who are out in the society and you're not evangelizing, but even within your church, they're living without Jesus. So it's to provoke us to patiently live godly lives as we're waiting. In 1 Peter 4, 7, Peter said, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Jesus is coming back. He had said to them, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. He, says, he said, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I will come again to receive you to myself. So he promised he's going to come. So seeing that he is returning soon, how are we to live? Well, he tells us, verse 12, Cast off the works of darkness. Put on the armor of light. Cast off and put on. Cast off. That word cast off, those words mean lay aside. Lay aside works of darkness. We, According to Ephesians 5.11, we are to have no fellowship with what are called the unfruitful works of darkness. We're to expose them. So it's not time to backslide. It's not time to return to the old life. Please remember what it was like before you got saved. Because the enemy has a way of putting into your mind the idea that it was so much better then. Is that true? Of course it's not. But he can make you think it was. Man, I remember when I used to just go out and party. I remember when I used to smoke that dope. I remember. That was fun, man. We had good times. Really? It was fun for you to get arrested, huh? It was fun for you to wake up in your own vomit. That was great times, right? No, that wasn't great at all. In 2 Peter 2.22, it's happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow, having washed to her wallowing in the mire. You see, because before we were saved, many of us, not all, but many of us were zealous for all kinds of evil. We were into the parties, we were into the drugs, we were into the drinking, the sexual sin and all of that. But that was the old miserable days. That's what led us to salvation. And we received Christ and we received his grace and, and we began to pursue him with all of our hearts. And so what we do is we look for the blessed hope. We look for the glorious appearing of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We cast these things off, but we put things on. We put on the armor of light. Why? Because we're children of light. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 5 through 7, he said, You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. Let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. But on the armor of light, we, we walk in the flesh, but we don't war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into subjection 
everything, all things, every thought into the obedience of Christ. That's what we do. We put these things down and we pick these things up. And we walk in the armor of light. Now, we already looked through Ephesians 6, which gave to us the weapons of our warfare. But when he speaks about these weapons, remember, our waist is to be girded with truth. What is that? Certainty that God's word is the truth. Like it says in Psalm 119, 160, the entirety of your word is truth. What is the first thing that was ever questioned in Scripture? What is questioned is God's word, has God said? That's the first question you find in the Bible. And the question was in the mouth of Satan. And so question God's truth. That's what we see every day. So what we do is we gird our waist with the truth of the word. We also put on what is called a breastplate, the breastplate of righteousness. So we re rest in our standing before God. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So we have truth, we have righteousness, our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We, we, we guard our walks, the enemies on the prowl, so we remain in a state of constant alert. We have the shield of faith with which we quench the enemy's attacks. When he speaks about having the shield of faith, it's the ability to apply everything we believe about God to that circumstance. We put on a helmet of salvation. Why? Because Satan is continually bombarding our minds. He encourages us to doubt. He encourages us to doubt God, to doubt our salvation. And he does whatever he can in whatever way he can to discourage us as we walk with the Lord. What do I do? What have I done for all these years? I've learned to dwell on the reality of the salvation that God has given to me. When the enemy has whispered in various ways, you're not saved, I've always gone back to Scripture and I said, no, I'm saved because God's word says I am when I trust in Jesus Christ. His word is true. I use the sword of the Spirit, which he says is the word of God. The sword, the sword is to be wielded skillfully and precisely for individual battles. And so we put on the armor And we walk, verse 13, properly as in the day. That word properly is worthy of the message that we proclaim. It speaks of that which is appropriate. We tell people that this is what God says, and we live as if we believe it ourselves. And that's how we do it. We walk in a sincere, appropriate manner. And then he says, and I'll point this out to you, when he says in verse 13, walk properly, He tells us what works of darkness are. Revelry, drunkenness, he said, not in lewdness and lust and not in strife and envy. These are works of darkness. Revelry and drunkenness. A lot of you understand this word if I say uh, uh, a drunken party. A lot of us know what that is. Licentiousness and lust, <laughs> that speaks of hopping from bed to another bed. It speaks about unbridled lust. When he speaks of strife and envy, strife and envy, aggressive arguing and contentious jealousy. And this is often the fruit of partying and drinking. You can go to parties, you know, and before you know it, somebody's angry. Somebody's starting an argument. Somebody's wanting to fight. And uh, that just happens. You've seen it. Many of you have seen it. Um, I've seen it. I've been there. I've done that before Christ. Yes. That's what parties turn into very often. People over drinking, people getting angry, and suddenly some five foot four, 102 pound man thinks he's six foot four, 300. <laughs> She's with me! <laughs> it's crazy, but it's true. That's the fruit of parties. You're drinking, drinking, drinking until you get real drunk, and the girl. You're with or picking up on, you're getting her more and more drunk. Why? Because you want to end up in bed with her. That's the fruit of these parties. They're not getting together, praying, and <laughs> they're doing other things. And he says, don't do that. That's not to be your life. Well, what am I to do? Verse 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh. Be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Walk in his love. 
Walk in his grace. In Colossians 3.12, it says, As the elect of God, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with hearts of compassion, of kindness, of humility, of gentleness, and of patience. He says, make no provision. That word provision, that's, that's forethought. It's a pre- mental preparation. Make no provision for the flesh. I'm going to go here. I'm going to do this for a little while. I'm going to do these things. And then I'm going to, and then I'll, that's what he's talking about. Don't give your, your flesh or the devil opportunity, opportunity to entice and encourage you to evil. Don't think and plan ways to fulfill your sinful desires. Calling up that girl and saying, you know, I saw you in church the other day. And, you know, I asked about how I could get in touch with you. And one of your friends were real kind and told me. I just want you to know that I think you're just a real sweet girl and like to have coffee with you. Would you? And the girl says, okay. (laughs) And it's just a scam. Because you're looking for a way to intrude. That's what you're doing. You're scamming her. And men, I'll say this quickly, but one of the things that I believe is true, and I haven't been disproven yet, is men by nature are hunters. And the more the challenge, the greater the effort till I can break you down. And then leave you. Because who wants to get married? I don't have to. That's a big thing now, isn't it? People aren't getting married. They don't have to. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Don't go that direction. Be wise. Be wise. Why? Because Jesus is coming. In Hebrews 10, 37, yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Revelation twenty two twenty. he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. And then the conclusion, amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Yield yourself to the Lord, guys. I can't tell you how many painful stories I've heard over the years of people who got bored, went back to the world for a while, and then paid a terrible price for doing so. Hold fast to the Lord and look up. Your redemption is drawing nigh. Our Father, we ask that you...